All right, class, this is a lecture giving you guys some pointers for exam four, your optional final exam, uh, dealing with chapter 27, looking at world history from 1945 to 1975. Now, this period is a very dynamic period in history and also a very recent period in history. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, a period that ended 47 years ago. So obviously a lot of people, myself included, were born and grew up during this time. So we're talking about a period of time uh, that, you know, in a lot of ways is, is too close to really, really assess accurately because, you know, so many people who lived through it are still around. But still, it's an important time and, and we need to talk about it because it really has a major effect on the world that we see today. Now, 1945, of course, is very significant because this was the year that World War II ended. And before World War II ever ended, uh, a number of things were in motion. First of all, it became clear that with the end of the war, uh, the alliance that had developed between uh, the Soviet Union and America and, and, the, and the Western European countries, that was, that was collapsing. Uh, there was going to be tension between the two countries. And of course, as, as was mentioned in the end of chapter 26, that became what was known as the Cold War, a period where there was significant levels of hostility between the United States and the Soviet Union. But it was a period that never resulted in direct conflict between the two countries. However, there was significant competition, uh, both economically, ideologically, and also indirect competition between, uh, in terms of trying to gain an influence, trying to gain influence in different parts of the world and the two sides uh, supplying each other's uh, uh, allies with military uh, hardware in order to fight one another. Now, as World War II ended, for Europe and for Japan and for China, the, really, the question was, you know, how are we going to rebuild these countries? These were countries that had been devastated by war. Uh, in Japan, for instance, had, had been, you know, is the only country in history so far to have been sub subjected to nuclear bombing. Uh, Germany had been really flattened uh, by carpet bombing uh, towards the end of the war. Uh, Russia had lost, you know, over 20 million people. And so, you know, big stretches of the earth had been devastated. And so there was a question of how, how countries were going to uh, rebuild themselves. You know, even Britain, which had never been invaded, had been bombed extensively during the war and also was broke at the end of the war. Uh, you know, the World War II cost a lot of money. Well, what we've seen is that before the war was over, we saw the Brayton Woods... Uh, meeting. And we see that there was the development of uh, economic agencies that allowed for uh, cooperation uh, in the West. Uh, we see the beginnings of the IMF. We begin to see the development of the International Monetary Fund. And we also see, for instance, that the dollar is held up as the Standard, you know, all, all currency gets, you know, the currency in the West gets pegged to the dollar. And uh, this kind of stabilizes economies and also really facilitates trade between countries. And in Europe in particular, what we see is that uh, initially there's, there's an agreement between countries and between countries in uh kind of uh, West Central Europe, uh, the German Federal Republic, what was then West Germany, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Italy, formed the European Coal and Steel Community, ECSC. And this would eventually become the foundation for what becomes known as the uh, EU. You know, uh, uh, initially they called the, the EEC, European Economic Community, and nowadays is known as the EU, uh, which... Uh, in later periods would end up with uh, a common currency and a common market between uh, the countries of uh, Western Europe. And so what we see is that in direct contrast to what had happened in 
in the lead up to World War II. Uh, the countries in Europe decided to go away from autarky, you know, the notion that uh, countries could, could become self-sufficient and actually actively work to connect themselves financially and economically. Now, the United States, although it was not a member of the European community, played a huge role in this because the United States came out of World War II like it did in World War I with its industrial infrastructure completely intact because it was not attacked. The only part of America that got hit during World War II was uh, Pearl Harbor, which is by no means an industrial uh, uh, area. And so, therefore, the United States came out with its industrial capacity completely intact and had a massive uh, surplus because of the war and was able to invest all over the world. So what we see is that private United States companies invest all over the world and also the United States government comes up with what is known as the Marshall Plan, named after General George Marshall, who would go on to become Secretary of State and developed a plan for funding redevelopment in Europe. Now, similarly, the United States also supported uh, economic development in Japan. And what we see is that by the 1950s, uh, the economy in the West and in Asia is really starting to grow. And really all throughout uh, the 50s into the 60s, and it really it doesn't run into any significant slowing down until the end of this period, there's really strong growth. Now on top of this, uh, in the West, we also have a baby boom, you know, a generation which those, a period in time which those people who fought in the war come home and uh, they have children. And there's a huge spike in uh, children being born in, 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 from the late 40s until the early 60s. Now, this book defines the baby boom as ending around about 1957. Other books will say it ends around 1960. Some people end it, say it ends in 1964. The bottom line is that for uh, about 20 years after World War II, there was a really high rate of childbirth. Now, in addition to this, uh, we see a lot of technology coming into play. Now, some technology had been developed before World War II, like, for instance, television. Television actually had, uh, the technology of television had actually been developed by the late 1930s. The first television broadcast uh, were around 1939. However, because of the war, there was no development of television infrastructure because everything went into the war effort. And so what we see is that after, say, about 1947 or so, television uh, starts to be uh, developed in the United States and around the world. I mean, like, for instance, in the area here where, where I am, the greater St. Louis area, uh, KSDK uh, was built uh, around about 1947 or so. Uh, it was actually the second television station west of the Mississippi. I think the very first one was in, in Los Angeles. Uh, and so we see that technology developing. Now, television technology would be very significant. And eventually, uh, towards the end of the 1950s, uh, satellite technology, but we'll get into that a little bit more, would be significant because this would really make it possible for people to see images of, of news all over the world quite often in the very same day. And this meant that things that uh, might not have gotten as much attention in the past got a lot of attention in the past. And this, this affected a lot of things. I mean, ultimately, it would have a huge effect on uh, political movements. Uh, like, for instance, in the developing world where you have countries in Asia and Africa fighting for their independence, it would have a big effect on uh, movements in the United States, for instance, like the civil rights movement. Uh, when you have the filming of the bus boycotts or, or for, for instance, uh, the uh, disturbances that happened in Little Rock, Arkansas, when you have the, the attempt at integration of Central High School or when you see the uh, fire hoses in Birmingham, Alabama, this went all the way around the world. And it was a powerful incentive for the United States government and other governments uh, to make significant change. Now, but once again, this, this ties also into the Cold War because with the Cold War, you know, you have economic growth going along very swiftly in the West, but the Soviet Union 
uh, is growing very uh, strong, growing very quickly too. Now, one thing that the Soviet Union, both the Soviet Union and America, took advantage of, uh, especially rocket technology that uh, the, the Nazis did. And uh, they took that technology, they put those uh, guys to work, you know, quite often fellows, people who are actually war criminals. Uh, both the Russian and American governments conveniently ignored what they did and uh, put those fellows to work developing their rocket uh, technology. And this would eventually ex express itself in ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles that could be used to shoot bombs at each other. Now, fortunately, in the 70 or so years since that technology has been developed, uh, nobody's actually used it in war. But the other thing that was much more positive was that eventually this would be used in space technology. Uh, the Russians would be the first to send uh, devices into space. Sputnik would be the first satellite in 1957. The United States would come out later. And, and by the early 60s, we began to see weather satellites and communication satellites. So once again, like I said, techn television technology really had a big impact on getting information out, of, out around the world. Now, as I said before, television images had an impact on political movements. But the other thing that really had a big impact on political movements uh, goes back to what I said at the beginning, is that as at the end of World War II, colonial powers were really broke. And not only were they broke, uh, other countries saw the colonial, the uh, colonized countries saw Britain, they saw France, they saw the Netherlands, uh, they saw all these countries talking about freedom and democracy, equality. And so once World War II was over, it was very difficult to, to go back to colonized countries and say, you, you know, y'all need to be colonies again. So what we see, especially in Asia, the bigger colonies in Asia, uh, India, Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, uh, these countries got independence, you know, within a few years of the end of uh, World War II. Now, the process took longer in Africa, but Africans saw what was going on too and, and really pushed for uh, independence. Now, as the book mentions, in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, the process of independence was fairly quick. There was never a big settler presence in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa. And once it became clear that people like Kwame Nkrumah uh, in Ghana and others wanted to be wanted independence, there was not a lot of desire to keep pushing it. It was easier just to let these countries get their independence. Now, there were some exceptions, as the book mentions, and in particular colonies in Africa where there were significant settler populations. In, in the north of Africa, there was Algeria. And Algeria, in, 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 uh, for the French, they didn't even consider Algeria a colony. They just said it was actually an overseas department or, or, or province of France. Uh, now, there are other areas that France considers to be or overseas provinces or territories, like for instance, French Guiana in South America, New Caledonia in the South Pacific. But Algeria was far and away the biggest, and it had a huge uh, European population. About 10% or so of Algeria's population was European, but the majority of the population uh, were Algerian Muslims of Arab and Berber descent. And because French civil law denied citizenship to people who uh, wanted to observe Islamic law, the great majority of Algerians were not citizens, even though they were the majority population and the indigenous population of Algeria. They were denied uh, French citizenship. And so what we see is that after France is defeated in Vietnam, and this is very significant because uh, Vietnam would go on to become one of those countries that would really push towards uh, communism. Uh, once the French are pushed out uh, of Vietnam, the Algerians see this, the uh, uh, Muslim Algerians see this, and they begin to push for independence too. And so 
a very, very bloody war, you know, from 1954 to 1962 breaks out. Now, Americans tend not to realize how bloody the Algerian War was because it was not a war in which Americans were directly involved. Now, if you all ever want to get a good idea about the war, I, re I recommend that you watch the movie Battle of Algiers. It's a really interesting movie because the people who participated in the movie um, were uh, the, the Algerians who participated were, were actually people who, who fought in the actual revolution. And the Algerian revolution uh, resulted in over a million deaths. I mean, it was a very, very, very bloody war. And, and in a lot of ways, it was kind of the classic guerrilla war in that the French were able to knock down the insurgency in the cities, but the rural insurgency continued, and it began to put more and more pressure on the Europeans who stayed there, and eventually the French pulled out in 1962. And so of all the wars in Africa, the Algerian War was the bloodiest. However, there were other conflicts, like for instance in Kenya, there was the Mau Mau Rebellion that took place in, in the 50s, in which... Uh, European casualties were not that great, about 95. But there were significant African casualties, 11,000. And, and, and the British, the book doesn't talk about it, but the British really engaged in some really horrific torture and denial of human rights. You know, uh, did, they did some really gruesome things to, African pop, to uh, the Africans who were fighting for their independence. But once again, uh, by 1963, the British had pulled out. So what we see is that beginning in about you know, the first sub-Saharan African countries start getting their independence in the late 50s. You have Sudan in 1956, uh, then uh, Ghana in 1957. But by the time you get, to, but by the time you get from the period from about 1960 to 1966, uh, dozens of countries in Africa get their independence. Now, the place where you see the most resistance, once again, like in Algeria, is in South Africa, where you have a significant settler population. Uh, South, the, the, the settler population in South Africa in 1948 was as high as 20%. Although over, over time, it began, it began to decline. By the time uh, majority rule would come to South Africa in 1994, uh, the uh, population of people of European extraction would be under 10%. Uh, but it was a long struggle. And what we see is that the African National Congress, an organization that started in 1912, begins to organize. They were influenced by Gandhi, who started his career in South Africa, actually. You know, he didn't work for African independence, but he worked for a better position for uh, people of Indian extraction who lived, who lived in South Africa. What we see is that the African National Congress begins to use the nonviolent techniques that Gandhi uh, pioneered. To try to, pro to to protest the uh, inequality there. However, the government, the National Party, which was the government dominated by the Afrikaans-speaking whites, Afrikaans is a uh, essentially a pigeon form of Dutch, in that it has a lot less uh, verb tenses and stuff than you see in formal Dutch. Uh, though uh, they were determined not to uh, let go of the country, and they developed the system known as apartheid. And so what we see through the 1950s and 1960s is that they actually dug in their heels deeper. And we know we're not going to get to the period in which they get to the independence, but since this class ends in, uh, since we're going to stop our study by 1975. But, you know, for those who are curious, uh, majority rule does come to South Africa in 1975, and uh, the man who was a who was the leader of the movement in the 50s and 60s, Nelson Mandela, he would eventually become the first president in uh, in a non-racial election. Now, as I said before, there was significant competition between communism and uh, Marxism, and we see some really big gains for communism in the 1950s. Like I said before, Vietnam gets its independence in 1954, at, you know, from the French. And we see that North Vietnam, North Vietnam becomes dominated by the communists. However, the biggest country, the country that really is the linchpin of the movement of communism in, in, in Asia, is China. Uh, and the Chinese communists win the struggle with the Chinese nationalists in 1949. 
and uh, the Communist Party gains power in China and is, has, and has held on to power in China to, until this day uh, with no sign of going away. I think, I, think, I think for the foreseeable future, the Chinese Communist Party is going to run China, although uh, the type of government, the kind of social organization you see in China today is probably something that the founder, that the guy who really put the Chinese Communist Party on, on the map, Mao Zedong, he probably wouldn't recognize it because it is a system that uh, has incorporated a great deal of capitalism, which was completely different from what he did. Uh, although that's a good thing because uh, his attempts to try to develop the country without capital accumulation, uh, with ignoring the, 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 the middle class or, uh, you know, his attempts at... Uh, Cultural Revolution did not work. Uh, you know, he, you know, like for instance, the, the book talks about how he tried to have small scale smelting of iron. You know, it didn't work. There's a reason why there are big iron smelting factories. I mean, that's the efficient way to do it, especially if you want to have industrial levels of production. Uh, you know, later on in the 1960s, when he has the Cultural Revolution, you know, once again, uh, this ends up in a, in, a, in a lot of suffering because, you know, people who really have the skill set to really improve the country uh, find themselves, uh, you know, really being harassed and in, in a lot of cases being imprisoned or dying. And so really it's after the death of Mao Zedong in 1976 that China really starts to make a significant move towards, you know, really rapid economic development. But once again, that's beyond the period of what we're talking about. Now, a lot of people may wonder, why was communism so attractive to people in Asia? Now, some of it had to do with the fact that uh, Russia is the biggest country in Asia, and it was on the northern border of a lot of countries. I mean, like, for instance, in Korea, uh, the Russians facilitated uh, the communist movement there, which resulted in the divided Korea that we have until this day. Uh, but also, it's important to realize that people like Ho Chi Minh or like Mao Zedong did not have much faith in the West because they saw the West as uh, people who talked about freedom but were really unwilling to see that freedom be applied to people who were not of European extraction. And so uh, Marxism, communism seemed like a viable alternative to them. So to a large degree, uh, the, rest kind, the West kind of reaped what it sowed with the growth of communism in, in, in Asia, because, uh, you know, going back to World War I, at the end of World War I, uh, nationalists in places like China and Indochina, which, you know, not, which went on to become Vietnam, they were ignored. And that gave the Marxists a way to get in. And then also the Marxist criticism of capitalism to a lot of people seemed fair because the people in Asia at that time weren't benefiting. Now, weren't benefiting from capitalism. Now, of course, there were countries, you know, that went on to, went on to benefit from it. Uh, most famously, Japan, and then eventually also the countries like Singapore, uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. A lot of these countries would go on, uh, Hong Kong, a lot of these countries would go on to have very vibrant capitalist economies. Uh, you know, as the book mentioned, they became known as the Little Tigers of Asia. But that whole process could have been expedited had there not been that desire to kind of hold on to these colonial territories for a very, very long time. Well, anyway, class, I kind of hope that this gives you an idea of some of the themes to look for when you're writing your answers. And as I always say, I hope that you come to the end of the semester knowing more than you did at the beginning. I hope that you gain some information and some enlightenment into the history of the world, that you uh, found information about places that you hadn't thought about before, and that this was an edifying experience for you. Uh, you all have good careers wherever you're going. Take care.